All right, welcome to the first 2023 edition of Recent Release Roundup. Um, for those who don't know, this is a series I did last year where approximately each month I looked at 10 to 12 new releases and the reviews people had on them, and I link all the reviews down below, I have a Goodreads shelf down below. Everything you could ever want to know is in the description of this video. And yeah, we're gonna get into it because we have 11 books today. I will say that these are anticipated releases for my corner of booktube sometimes even outside of my corner sometimes I just like see something that's buzzy and I'm just curious and I throw it on sometimes there's a book that maybe only has one review on the internet but I'm still just like I want to know about that book it's very subjective how I curate this and with that preamble out of the way we're just gonna get into it starting with a non-speculative book there's usually always one or two on these things and this one I couldn't talk about January releases without talking about Spare which is the memoir by Prince Harry and yeah I had no intention of reading this book but I loved watching all of the reactions <laughs> and I have quite a wide range down below for you so I have five particular videos that I watched and really liked we've got Mara from Books Like Well and she handles this more as how does this memoir work as a book as a memoir sort of take and how it fits into other memoirs she's read and then we have kd who is a welsh booktuber and his perspective being so close to like the actual like monarchy and the politics that happen there that's his take is really interesting he also comes at it from like what is a memoir how is it accomplishing this but then also from that whole like Welsh perspective. I really liked his video. And then I have Jess Owens, who kind of talks about how it didn't meet her expectations and what worked and didn't work for her. I've got Ashley at the Bookish Realm, where it's in the middle of one of her weekly vlogs. It's like 10 to 20 minutes. I think it's more like 20 minutes <laughs> of her discussing the parts that were really difficult for her. And then also all of what Jess and Ashley were saying is kind of encapsulated a lot in Brie at the Lock Petitions review where it's like, on one hand, one part, you will empathize with Harry, what he went through as a kid, how he wasn't able to mourn his mother. And on the other hand, there's a whole section where we really just don't even deal with the imperialism and the history of one's family. And so yeah, I highly recommend all of those. They were all fascinating. Like the beginning of January was just me watching these videos. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I do know he does the narration. So if you want an audiobook, I guess he narrates it. What, what I've gathered is I still don't really want to read it myself. There's like a section on it that's very military based and it just like, I'm not actually that interested in the royals. I'm more interested in how people react to the royals than the royals themselves, you know? But that said, that was like truly a moment on booktube and I enjoyed it. Next up, we're gonna talk about How to Sell a Haunted House by Grady Hendrix. I have not read a Grady Hendrix. Ryan has read a Grady Hendrix. He just read Horror Store not too long ago. And what I have gathered is that he is really good at like campy but slightly unique horror potentially. And that's definitely what I got from this book. There are so many reviews for this and it actually showed me a different side of YouTube looking into this because what I typically do if some people I don't know haven't posted reviews is I just type book title review and I see what the YouTube search algorithm gives me. And so I definitely got to see more of like the horror side of booktube which is really fun and I definitely want to dabble there more. But we have a whole range of like two to five stars. <laughs> it is a controversial new release in the horror space. Um, Katie Coulson, who has liked other Grady Hendrix, gave it two stars. Allie from All I Do Is Read gave it three stars and had a really cool vlog for it. Um, it was a favorite for Zach, although I will say his review maybe is a little more spoilery than some people would like. I don't think it's technically spoilery, but I do think if you like going into your horror knowing like nothing, it's more of a reaction and you from the reactions you could guess what's happening. Um, Book Nerds and Things, who um, is going to feature a lot in this video, Book Nerd and Things was on it for new releases of January. <laughs> I think she's like in three or four of these books I am mentioning, um, but she gave it five stars and have a review for that. And her reviews are always really well broken down. Like if you like someone that goes like for just 10 minutes into like writing, characters, plot, wonderful. Um, Reading with Meg gave it five star. Mara from Books Like Well gave it four. Criminali said it was a fave of his by Grady Hendrix. Sin at the Book Nook really liked it. Bow at Books and Bow really liked it. And Rachel from Shades of Orange gave it four stars. So what did that all come down to? What is in this book where we have this wide range of appeal? And I think it comes down to how silly you like your horror and how scary you want your horror. Because this is definitely 
more silly campy 80s horror movie from what I got specifically in the vein of like if you don't like dolls or puppets that might creep you out a bit more and it's one of those horror stories where we are exploring grief specifically between these two siblings who are fighting and kind of have this history they need to unpack with each other because both of their parents died in a car accident leads to a really messy financial situation and then they're trying to sell this house but like the real tailor's like yeah this house is haunted I'm not selling it for you you need to you need to unpack that <laughs> and I think the book is them unpacking that while campy creepy horror shit happens okay uh, that's that's the general gist I got from it and the people who liked it I think really liked the ending they liked how it all came together it felt kind of wholesome to them I think and I think for some people that didn't feel right I will say that a lot of people said this was very character driven character focused which makes sense to me with like a grief theme tied to something so if you like exploring grief through characters, that should be really interesting. And a lot of people were impressed with how differently they felt about certain characters after going through the book. Like they met a character at the beginning, hated them, and then by the end it was a complete turnaround. So I'm actually kind of interested in this one. I haven't decided if Grady Hendrix is for me. I, I really, I don't know. I asked Ryan if he thought I'd like Horror Store because we have a copy right now. And he's like, I don't know. Because to him it was like kind of standard slasher horror. Um, and I bought that copy more for a friend back home. But this one, I, I do like a haunted house story. Like, I like haunted houses. So, like, it could happen. This next one, like, no one's talking about it. I found one review, though. And that is Vampire Weekend by Mike Chen. Um, he actually had a book come out last year that no one else talked about. <laughs> and this one sounds really odd. I, I don't know if I'll pick it up. But I kind of like the idea of it, which is looking at vampires, how they exist in society, in contemporary space, and specifically the vampire we follow is really into punk rock. And yeah, that, that's basically what I got. And it reminded me a little bit when um, the reviewer wrestling with books was talking about it, how at the beginning of each chapter, there's a debunking of a vampire myth, because this isn't standard vampires. They aren't feeding off people and stuff like that in the streets. There's different systems set up in society for vampires to survive. And there was these debunking of myths at the beginning, and it kind of reminded me a little bit of Mongrels. Like, I don't think they're going to be the same type of story, but Mongrels is like a contemporary werewolf story by a Stephen Graham Jones. And so it was reminding me of that type of framework. So if you want a unique take on vampires, that book just came out. I will say one of the caveats in that review was that sometimes there was some non-linearity. We're looking at the past of this vampire and present day, and sometimes that wasn't telegraphed very clearly for her as a reviewer. I'm just, you know, I'm interested in this author. He writes a book every year, and they're always, like, really different in the speculative space, and I really need to pick them up because I don't think they're, like, what we're used to in genre space, but, but he does have me curious. Back into a popular anticipated release of January, Hellbent by Lee Bardugo. <laughs> The ever-anticipated book. When I was looking at this, everyone kept mentioning how it took a whole three years for this to come out, and I was just like, it doesn't feel like that long to me. I, like, I read this in 2020, so, like, I don't know, but I also, like, I liked the first book. I liked Nine Houths. It was a good time. I wasn't, like, itching for Hellbent. It's not my type of paranormal fantasy, but, you know, in, in general, I wasn't the one itching for the next book in this series, but it's out now, so what did people think? Well, we have a lot of people down below that I'll link you to, J.R. Carroll, Life as Monet, Maya Kaur, Tori Morrow, and Connor Matthew, books and other things. <laughs> so yeah, I have all of them. And I think Tori Morrow liked it the least. Um, a lot of these are vlogs. Some of them are reviews. All of them are spoiler free. And if they're not, they're clearly like verbally, they're like, I'm going to talk about spoilers now sort of things for those videos. But in general, minus Tori's kind of like lukewarm, but still gave it four star review. Everyone who liked Ninth House, who then picked up Hellbent because they wanted to know what happened next, were, were pleasantly surprised. Some of them didn't like it as much as Ninth House, and I think this definitely is not Dark Academia. What I was gathering from these reviews is that this is definitely now more your paranormal fantasy, like what you associate with Buffy. Like, if this is Dark Academia, it's like season four of Buffy, is what I have gathered, okay? And for those who don't know season four of Buffy, that's when she goes to college, okay? She... She doesn't, she doesn't do well. She doesn't do well. <laughs> um, so yeah, and it's not necessarily as dark in content as Nice House. Like it's still graphic and we're still dealing with the supernatural, but a lot of the content warnings you needed for the first book, I don't think apply here. Um, and I heard that the side characters get a tiny bit more fleshed out here. Um, oh, I will say, did I not write down her name? I think it's the book Leo. I don't know how I didn't write down her name because actually hers was one of my favorites. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> she, like, it's one of my favorites. I'm remembering it days after watching it. She was breaking down how Lee Bardugo does character works across her major series and how it typically her characters are stronger when she gets to write in their perspectives. And there's like a slight section here where you get some perspective for side characters. And that was for the book Leo, what brought those characters a tiny bit more to life or at least into context. Um, the Darlington question will be answered for anyone who like wanted to know what happened to Darlington. That's a big point of contention with Nine House is like the Darlington question. Um, and I hear that this isn't necessarily like steamy, but if you wanted some relationship tension that that might be delivered in this book, which has me kind of curious. Like I wasn't itching to pick up this book, but maybe once I've read all of the Cassandra Clare I've been reading lately, <laughs> this need, might need to be the next thing I pick up. Who knows? But in general, satisfying sequel, less dark academia, more urban fantasy with some, you know, dark occult, maybe pseudo werewolf stuff. I don't know, like things you associate with paranormal urban fantasy sort of stuff. Continuing into very popular authors releasing books, we have The Stolen Air by Holly Black. Um, and this is, okay, it's not a sequel to the Cruel Prince trilogy, but it takes place after the Cruel Prince trilogy by eight years, and it's going to be the start of, I believe, a duology? I could be wrong about the duology part, but it's the first book in the next set in the same world, eight years after the events of the Cruel Prince. You will probably spoil the events of the Cruel Prince if you read this book. It follows Oak, who is the half-brother of Jude in the first book, but it's actually not his point of view. It's a different character who apparently showed up in the Queen of Nothing, but I don't remember this character, but there, there is, there is a character in the Queen of Nothing who is our main point of view for this. Okay. Um, people I have down below, um, Roy Reading Co. gave it a three out of five stars and I found that review incredibly insightful. So I want to point you there, but the book Leo also finished reading the Cool Prince series and talked about this book in the same video in which we talk about Hellbent. So that video is like a one-stop shop for a lot of the stuff we're discussing in like the last five minutes. Um, we have Locke's Library, books and other nerd things, <laughs> Maya Core and Andrea Reads. And yeah, there were so many videos on this. I think I found the side of booktube that I've never seen before <laughs> when I started looking for this. I was just like, oh my gosh, there's so many. I could not, I physically could not watch them all. And especially because a lot of them were saying really similar things. So it kind of got to the point where after I watched like the eighth video, I was like, okay, I get it. I totally get it. So this is not enemies to lovers. If you want Jude and Cardin, which I can't relate to, but say that's a thing you loved. That's it's not here. There is, as everyone in all of these videos said, Jude and Cardin are not in this book. I am sorry, they are not here. If you wanted that level of fan service, that did not happen in this book. There is like a friends to maybe lovers kind of trope. We have these people who knew each other as kids, reconnect, go on a quest together. And this book is largely a slow quest story. And I am unclear. Some reviews said it took place in the Fey world and some reviews said it took place in our world. And I'm unclear on who was correct. <laughs> but regardless, there's a lot of traveling. There's a lot of mistrust, which is kind of interesting because both of our main characters are like Fey and they can't lie. But there's, you know, the Fey always get around that whole we can't tell lies situation. And so they are traveling together. They are rekindling their friendship. Maybe it develops into something more. So it's a different type of relationship dynamic and it's not going to give you that same tension. What is interesting is Jude and Cardin don't get a lot of page time together in the Cruel Prince trilogy, but these guys are together pretty much the entire book. And people kept bringing up how this is different from the Cool Prince, but it's still tropey like that. It still has some parallels between Jude and the main character of this in a way that feels comfortable and cozy while being its own new thing, which I do think is a skill. Um, so if you liked the Cruel Prince, I do think you will like this just knowing it's not, it's not the Cruel Prince. Like it's not that trilogy. So if the things you really liked about it were the will they won't the and the political drama that was in it, like the court intrigue, that's not here. But if you like, like the main, like in this case, we're flipping it on its head. We have a main character who was a changeling who was in the human world and then brought back to the Fey world. So it's like a similar parallel to what happened to Jude in the Cruel Prince, but she's, she's our own character doing her own thing. Um, I hear that if you read this a far time away from the Cool Prince trilogy, you might be confused um, in terms of the politics. I'm not convinced if you read it close, you would be less confused because I just found the politics kind of like very name droppy, which for me is like my least favorite way of handling politics. If you're just going to drop a bunch of names at me and expect me to remember how those names interact, eh, probably not happening. But just know that if you want world building context, might want to squeeze in a cruel prince trilogy reread in there 
Moving on to the other young adult I have on this list is Song of Silver Flame Like Night. I despise this title. <laughs> I'm sure there's a reason why it's called this, but the sick, it's too long and it falls into that trap of like the blank of blank and blank and I just, it's so long. Every time people talk about it, it's like tongue twisters. I like only said it because I could read it. This is a tangent. This is young adult, but people have said in the reviews that it could have new adult appeal. So it's like definitely one of those like crossover books. Reviews for this book and other nerd things. I, again, I'm telling you, MVP on re anticipated releases reviews. You should really check her out. Um, Roger, Elliot, Brittany from Books with Brittany, um, Ramey Reads, Sarah Wayseekers books. I've got all those reviews down below. In general, we have two main point of views. And we are dealing with, I think, rebellion. And I think, so we have a female and a male point of view. The female, she has this mark from her mother and there's this whole mystery of how, why did her mother give her this mark? And there's oppression in this regime. And so it's mysterious. It's high action. That is what I got. There are stakes, there are decisions that need to be made, potential corruption arc sort of stuff. And a lot of people really wanting the next book because of where this book left out. Um, so yeah, themes of rebellion, discovering your past, what is the cost for freedom and fighting repressive systems. So for me, none of these are my buzzwords, especially because I don't know if their relationship dynamic, like Roger legitimately said, if you like more like tension and angst in your relationship dynamics, this might not work. And like, this is kind of my bread and butter. <laughs> like if that's like part of like the appeal of picking up a book and I'm still waiting to not be as burnt out on rebellion fantasy in particular, but this sounds like it is a very good version of that if that is your bread and butter. So um, I will point you to those reviews. And now we're going to get into books that also are crossover appeal, all technically adult, but could easily appeal to people who typically read young adult, starting with The Daughters of Izdahar. I was so happy that the Harbor Collins strike ended so I could talk about this book. I want to maybe read this book, but I was like, if a HarperCollins strike is still happening, I can't put it in this video. <laughs> Thankfully that happened. And so we've got reviews from Judith from Dead Good Book Reviews, um, Sarah at Sarah Reads, which is a very, very good, well thought out review, highly recommend. Um, Books with Zara, who was the odd one out. What I'm going to talk about is a lot of people said this was plot driven, but Books with Zara actually said it was character driven for her. So it just shows you how reading is such a subjective experience. Abby Salter, Life is Monet, and then Today, I didn't have it in my notes, but today I watched Jashana's review of this video. All right, so already kind of hinted at people talk about this as a very plot driven story. I believe it's two point of views. I know we have at least two, there could be three. We have two women in this society that is very oppressive for women. So themes of fighting the patriarchy are strong in this one. Some would say, many would say very on the nose. If you don't like on the nose theming, if that's not cathartic for you, if that's not enjoyable for you, you, you might want to pass this one by. Or if you think the other stuff is so good, you can get past this hurdle. If it is a hurdle for you, go for it. Um, but we have two women, they're in different classes. One is poor, one is rich, but they both are struggling because they can't do what they want to do because of society. One works as a bookshop, she's the poor one. And she's not supposed to be like enjoying her work because she's supposed to get married off and be the housewife, stuff like that. And then the other one has to be in an arranged marriage, but because of stuff that's set up, she's able to go to this magic school she wants to go to. But originally she wasn't going to be able to do that. And they both end up as a daughter of Izdahar, which is like the rebellious force against the patriarchy. And there's elemental magic in this book. One's an earthbender and one's a waterbender. I know they're not benders. I think they're weavers, but like, anyways, <laughs> there's elemental magic and it's tied to your emotions. And women are not allowed to practice their magic because when your emotions get out of whack, bad things happen. And that happened in the past. So now it's like another way of controlling women. It seems like there's, you know, a lot of standard things, but also things that are like timeless and anger inducing and maybe a cathartic way for me, especially if this is as plot driven as people have led me to believe. Like people are like, this is a page turn. Like I think Deshana didn't really like this book, but I think even she said she read it in like two days. And like, that could be fun. That could be a really good time. It's um Northern African Egyptian inspired fantasy. So that's like the type of setting we're in. And I do think Zara was talking about a lot of the food that was brought in and food that she's familiar with. So that was pretty cool. And you know, we're also exploring classism by having these two women who, you know, are both affected by the patriarchy, but in different ways. And one definitely has more privilege and apparently is really bad at noticing that. And that's like a repetitive quality to her. So if that's going to annoy you, apparently this is something that happens with her. So that's what I've heard about this book. I just love the cover. I'm not gonna lie. I love it. I kind of want it, 
just because it's really pretty. But it's been hard for me lately, except for Nikki Drayden, I haven't been clicking with Harper Voyager titles, which I know is a broad statement, but I have noticed that they tend to be like the fantasy imprint that is like collecting the new adult titles. Like we don't have a new adult section, but they keep collecting that extreme crossover appeal book, which sometimes really works for me, but lately hasn't been, unfortunately, or has been only at most a four star experience, which is still really good. But that doesn't mean I want to buy it for my shelves, you know? Um, next up, we have Tress in the Emerald Sea. I'll be brief about this. There are so many videos on this. I am in two live shows for this. I don't have a spoiler-free review because I didn't... At the time I finished Tress, which was like two weeks after it came out, there were already so many. I was just like, the world doesn't need another one of me just going, I liked it. It was fun. <laughs> You know, um, what I will say is what I did actively choose to do for this video, because there are so many positive reviews, and I will link those down below, um, that discuss what they really liked about Sanderson's take on a fairy tale and stuff like that. Like I said, so many live shows. I went and I found two three-star reviews that I found, and then I found a YouTuber I didn't know, and I'm now following him because we all think we're Cosmere fans. I don't think I could be as much of a Cosmere fan as this guy. Um, I think his name's Cam Reads. His video was so fun. It was like 18 minutes and like he was bringing, I've been in two live shows where we talked about Cosmere Connections. He brought up Cosmere Connections I already had missed and his delight in this book is infectious, but it's incredibly spoiler filled. Um, but he is now one of my like go-to, like I want to watch Sanderson videos from this guy. Okay. Like truly infectious energy. Loved it. Want to point you there if you've read the book and you can want to keep geeking out with someone. Ah, oh, so good. Um, but Treebeard and Phantology were the two three-star reads, and they basically were three-star reads for the same reason. They didn't get on with the humor. And I think that's totally fair. Um, this book is really, really heavy, like, on the style. This is Hoyd telling a story. Hoyd has a very particular storytelling style. At one point, he's going to be very on the nose discussing life and its meaning in ways that are, like, kind of like you want to highlight every line sometimes, but also I could equally see someone not thinking it's that deep or wanting to do that. And then it's like, there's like a poop story. Like Sanderson's humor is like extremely dad humor. And that's just not working for everyone, right? <laughs> so if Mistborn Era 2 was a rough time, yeah. Um, I will say a lot of people, including Cam Reads, but also my friend Sophia at Sophia Slots, have compared this type of writing style to what he does in his Alcatraz series, which if you've tried that out, maybe that's a better barometer for you. Um, another thing Cam Reads brought up was like, he just really liked that this felt like Sanderson writing for himself, like his earlier works. And I definitely felt that too. Not that Sanderson, I think, has been writing differently lately, but you could feel the lack of pressure, if that makes sense. I don't know. Like, this isn't a Stormlight book, right? This isn't like the end of a series. The, their stakes are so low in terms of what matters if people like or don't like it, right? Like, this is just a story he wrote because he wanted to tell it. And you can feel that that joy and that exploration, you know, of creativity. So that's all I have to say about Tress. It, it, I, th I think we can say it's been a successful release. And now into Encyclopedia of Fairies, because we had two popular fae books <laughs> come out this month. And I wasn't even going to talk about this book because I truly was not interested. But then I just kept seeing review after review. And I'm like, if the whole point of this series is to collect the buzz, this book is buzzy. And I've seen it either really work for people or people DNF it because it's just not. Like, that's the extremes I've seen. I've seen less in the middle. I think the most middle would be Abby Salter's review. I really love um, Bookish Melody's review. That's the review I would point you to. Bookish Melody always does Friday videos on specific books, um, and I always love them. They're always really well thought out. And, and spoiler-free in the way that I like. Like, I never feel like how much she talks about a book spoils my experience. It really sets up my expectations. And so in this one, she really likes... And so it was interesting hearing from her perspective as a reader what this brought to for her, like what it focused on and how it like fed into her geeky side when she used to do like fae research for certain projects. Because this is like a pseudo academic diary by our main character who is an academic. I, I hesitate to compare this to Lady Trent because people who love Lady Trent have not loved this in the same way. So I'm not I don't think it's like that type of comp, but it's a similar narrative framework of this person going to this town to study the fae instantly ostracizes herself because of miscommunication, potential neurodivergence coding in this character. And then there's like kind of sort of an academic rival. And it's not a romance, although there is a romantic component. But I have seen this book work less for people because they don't like the, the love interest because he's just a little too 
mean or comes across as mean to our main character early on, even though throughout the story they do bond and come together and work with each other. And apparently it's just kind of the type of series where people could keep seeing like episodic books in it. Like this is the start of a series, but it does have like a contained arc in what we're learning. I don't know if I'll pick this up. Um, mainly because I don't know if I'll like this character as much as Isabella Trent. And the only reason I love Lady Trent as much as I do is because of Isabel. Like, the actual plot device of <laughs> the Lady Trent series doesn't work for me, which is, like, studying X mythological creature. I could care less about that. And, like, part of me, like, all of these things people talk about remind me of Half a Soul, which also only kind of worked for me. So I'm nervous about it. I don't know, maybe one day I would try it out, but for people who are living in their like pseudo cozy fantasy romance cottagecore era, definitely one that you need to try for yourself to see if you are the people who are like, yes, five star, exactly what I want. And I do think you'll know pretty early on if it's not for you. Um, that, cause that's what I've gotten. Like people DNF'd pretty early on, like 50 to hundred pages if it like wasn't working for them. All right, these next two, we don't have as much to go on. So we're almost done. The Keeper Six by Kate Elliott. I've got Beautifully Bookish Bethany and Rachel from Shades of Orange to point you to for this one. This is a novella in the same world as Servant Mage, but it's not, it's not the same people. It's a companion novel. And it's like a fantasy book, but it has some sci fantasy elements because I think there's like dimension hopping, which I guess we've decided dimension hopping is sci-fi. I don't know. I feel like I see it used in fantasy and I don't like clock that as sci-fi, but I, I can see why we clock it as sci-fi, but just know that's the only little thing. We have this grandmother um, and her son and son-in-law's kid, I think, gets stolen. So she's got to go save the grandkid. And I think that's the plot of this book. <laughs> and I don't know, the joy that Bethany describes this book with makes me really want to pick it up. Um, and I, I do need to pick up Kate Elliott. Like, the number of times that authors recommend Kate Elliott at their, like, author signings, I'm just like, okay, I get it. And, like, they are an author who has been writing in the sci-fi fantasy space for so long, and I have picked up zero works. <laughs> I was a little apprehensive about Servant Mage because it's like the standard, there's a dragon on the cover, but there's like no dragon in the book. I do think this one I'm more likely to pick up than the other one because I do like this whole grandma trying to like save the grandkid energy. Um, but I will say Rachel from Shades of Orange liked it, but didn't love it. And is still like searching for that perfect Kate Elliott for them. But both of them were like great representation, creative ideas. So if you're looking for that in a novella format, here you go. And then the last one is the big sci-fi that I have on this. And I, there are so few reviews for this. And I, this is the one I'm most curious about. And that is The Terraformers. Um, I do have Scribbling Cat, which is the one standalone review I could find. And then I have a YouTube short by Sarah Wayseekers Books. And then Judith from Dead Good Book Reviews talked about it briefly in a recent reads video of hers. So what I have gathered is that this is definitely kind of the type of sci-fi where you can't get attached to characters very strongly. Um, one of the reviews straight up liked, loved the ideas, but did not connect the characters. And I think part of that is in a different review, I learned there are three parts and in each part you have different characters. And although the other characters may or may not show up in other parts, you don't get to like spend time with them. So the minute you get like attached, you're moving on. This is kind of standard in like sci-fi that explores societies and ideas, which this is definitely exploring. And I think it does so in a hopeful way. At least that's what Judith said. I learned a lot about the really bad ethical capitalism it explores because it's definitely exploring the darker sides of corporation and capitalism and terraforming of a planet in a far, far, far future. But also it seems to do it in a way that is geared towards hopefulness and change. like. I don't know, not, it's not the darkest sci-fi, even though it touches on dark things. And that world building sounds fascinating. And sometimes if the idea is cool enough, I can go along with it. Like for example, symbiosis, you don't get attached to character there. Every chapter is a different generation. And so that type of sci-fi doesn't bother me, but I do think it's something you need to go in knowing. Um, but uh, I just really, I really want to read it. And I hope I like it. I've not read a book by this author. I have no idea if the writing style will work for me, like no clue. And it's, not as pretty in person, in my opinion, as it the cover is because of the way they did the spine. So I think I'll probably just have to borrow it from the library because I'm just like, I don't, I'm very picky about the books that I purchase for myself. And I just like the dust jackets just, it has, it doesn't, I don't know how to explain it, but the spine is not as good as the cover. And then if they don't fold it right, you can see the spine with the cover on the front. And it's very shallow of me, but I don't love it. But that is this recent release roundup. A lot of great books. Um, if you do have thoughts about the Terraformers, let me know because I really want to know. <laughs> um, 
that's it for this one. If you want to leave an emoji, just to let me know you're here. You don't have thoughts about any of these books. You don't want to like have a conversation down in the comments. Oh, I don't know. Leave me a bunny because of Hellbent, even though that is a terrifying cover. Like, I, ugh, I don't love that cover. Otherwise, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.